Welcome to the April 23rd Amherst History Society Lecture Series, History Bites. Today we have Mr. Jim Hamilton, who is talking about the history of the World War I Amherst, World War I Ambulance Brigade, not brigade, company, squad, known as the Black Cats of Amherst. Shortly after the United States declared war on Germany, April 1917, a group of Amherst residents, including townspeople, students, and professors, enlisted in the U.S. Army to serve as a, in an ambulance unit supporting French soldiers driving Model T and Fiat trucks. This unit was nicknamed the Black Cats of Amherst and served with distinction in France and Belgium during the last year of World War I. Uh, we have Mr. Jim Hamilton, who will talk about this because he is the grandson of a black cat. He's a graduate of Amherst College and he's published two books on the black cats. The first is The Black Cats of Amherst, which I think we can see on our screens. And the second is We Unite to Serve, the Wartime Diaries of Reverend Stoddard Lane. Uh, his other works include The Writing 69th, which is a true story of a group of war correspondents who covered the US 8th Air Force out of England during World War II. So we're looking forward to a fascinating lecture uh, by Mr. Jim Hamilton, and please welcome. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, really look forward to this and look forward to your questions as well. Uh, feel free to write them in the chat, or if you prefer, we'll just take questions at the end of the presentation, but why don't we get going? So what we have here are two views of Amherst uh, taken about 100 years apart. They were both taken from the top of Johnson Chapel on the Amherst College campus, looking out toward the center of the town of Amherst. If you see on your left hand side of that shot, Pleasant Street Route 16 kind of runs up the side of both photos. In the top photo, we're looking out toward Massachusetts Agricultural College in the distance the Amherst College campus dominates the center right of the top photo. And as you examine the more recent photo on the bottom, you can see signs of the University of Amherst in the distance. Uh, UMass's predecessor was Mass Aggie, the Massachusetts Agricultural College, commonly referred to as MAC at the time. The big brick building in the lower photo on the left is, the, is UMass's uh, W.E.B. Du Bois Library. So this is the freshman class picture of uh, 1920. Uh, my grandfather somehow avoided this shot. He tended to do those kinds of things. As you look around this picture, you see that they're all white men except for one. Uh, his name is Frederick Allen Parker. He was one of about 16 men who graduated uh, from Amherst College between 1920 and 1929. Um, that includes one of the, the most famous Amherst graduates in 1926. Uh, that was Dr. Charles Drew. So you know, all male class, almost all white. Uh, women didn't arrive in, you know, on the Amherst campus for decades after that. Now, the guy on the left is my grandfather, Hugh Hamilton. Um, he was a New Orleans boy and he came to Amherst to live with his aunt and uncle. Uh, he graduated from, Am from Amherst High School and continued his education at Amherst College starting in the fall of 1916. Uh, his uncle was Kenyon Butterfield there in the center. And the family story goes that Uncle Kenyon saw some potential in Hugh and wanted him to get a good education, which is why he opened his home to him. His home, as it turns out, uh, was Hillside, the president's mansion at Mass Aggie. Now, if any of you attended uh, UMass, you'll likely remember a dormitory called Butterfield. Well, it's named after Kenyon Butterfield, um, uh, Hugh Hamilton's uncle. So letters sent to my grandfather at the time, I, I like this, they were addressed simply Hillside, Amherst, Massachusetts. Now the fall of 1916 was a pretty heady time for a college freshman at Amherst. Uh, the fall of 1916 marked the poet Robert Frost's first semester teaching full time. Uh, and though much of the talk was about the football team, if you read the school paper, the topic that thundered in the distance was the war in Europe, which had been going on since 1914. 
Now, if you were to look at the Amherst College newspaper of the day, you'd believe that the most serious impact of the war was whether the athletic teams would be able to continue to compete as many of the star athletes had left for war service. In April of 1917, the United States, which had been staying out of the conflict, finally declared war on Germany. Every male college student above the age of 18 began evaluating his options. Now, perhaps at the urging of his uncle, my grandfather wrote a letter to Robert Lansing, the Secretary of State. Uh, Lansing was an Amherst College graduate of the, of the class of uh, 1886. Uh, and my grandfather wanted some advice from someone outside of the college. He'd heard enough from professors and preachers. He wrote, Amherst is divided in its opinion as to what should be done in the present crisis. So Lansing's response came quickly and was unequivocal. He wrote, this country has but one great national purpose at the present time, and that is to prosecute the war with Germany. The, this letter, as you can see, showed up on the front page of the Amherst College student newspaper, and it really had a very significant effect. By the end of the college year in June, about half of the student body had withdrawn. My grandfather had already signed up for a summer of agricultural work, which like shipbuilding and some other essential industries was considered a form of government work. But in June, he changed his mind, opting to enlist in the army to join an ambulance unit that was being formed at the college. This photo, which my grandfather actually did manage to get into up in the upper corner there under the uh, H in Amherst, kind of peeking out from behind. Um, this photo was taken sometime in the summer of 1917 in Allentown, Pennsylvania at Camp Crane, the training ground for the US Army Ambulance Service. Many of these men, but not all, came from Amherst College. There were even two young professors plus a couple of ministers in their late 20s. There were also a few Mass Aggie students and townspeople from Amherst and the surrounding towns. Um, if you see that kind of brooding, dark-haired man at the far left third row, uh, that's Stoddard Lane. You'll, you'll hear more from him as he kept a diary during that time. He was a minister, a congregational minister, and chose to enlist in the army after the death of his wife, who had died not long after giving birth to their son. At Camp Crane in Allentown, Pennsylvania, they were turned, into student, they were turned from students into soldiers. My grandfather actually was very proud of this particular picture. You see him there, uh, third from the left. Um, his unit had been chosen as a model for the way they wore their uniforms and packs, and this photo was used for training purposes. Uh, the unit, which ultimately took the designation SSU 539, spent much of June, July, and August 1917 in training. Toward the end of August, they shipped out to France on the San Jacinto, a uh, 6,000 ton steam powered passenger ship that my father called the dirtiest place I was ever in. Surviving several U-boat scares, they disembarked in Saint-Nazaire, France on August 21st, 1917. Now, this handsome guy on the left, um, he's an American lieutenant uh, who was in charge of SSU 539. He was a University of Georgia graduate who had recently completed his law degree at the University of Virginia. His name was John Bocock. Now, there are several things worth noting about this photograph. First, you can see he is wearing a French Croix de Guerre medal with star and palm. He also has a forage on his shoulder, another honor showing that he and his men had been cited for their work in French army dispatches. It's quite an honor. And uh, you see, SSU 539 was assigned to work with the French army. Um, that shot above in the upper right hand corner shows Americans and Frenchmen around a table uh, in the sort of combined international leadership that they had for this service. So it was the, the US uh, army folks providing ambulance service so that Frenchmen could be involved in other areas like infantry, artillery or whatever. And just as a note, if you were wondering, SSU stands for Section Sanitaire Etats Unis. So a little map here, given a little outline of where the unit spent its time abroad. You can see they arrived in San Nazaire in August of uh, 1917. Between September 1917 and July of 1918, they were in Northern France, including an extended stay in the Champagne region. 
activity really began to heat up in July of 1918. Uh, during the last months of the war, they were in Belgium and ultimately reached as far as Bad Durkheim, Germany, before returning to Brest, France for their return trip home. This map comes from their unit history. Um, their first assignment was in the box marked with a Roman numeral one in the area around Chalon. Uh, to the east of Paris. Uh, the boxes marked two and three are near Soissons, northwest of Paris. They also spent some time in Belgium. You see the box marked with the Roman numeral four near Ghent. So they participated in five minor operations in the sectors that you see um, denoted by the small gray arrows, and then three major um, operations. Uh, the Ainmarne Offensive, which is what they tended to call the July attack, the Was Ain Offensive, the Soissons attack, and then the Ypres Lee Offensive, what they call the Flanders attack. So for the most part, this unit drove Ford Model T ambulances. In fact, when they first arrived in France in August of 1917, they actually began their service by assembling Model T chassis that had been shipped to Saint-Nazaire. And that's where many of them actually learned to drive. Uh, for a short period of time in the fall of 1917, they were assigned Fiats. If you look at the image in the upper left-hand corner, that's, that's a Fiat. Uh, they weren't very happy about that. They really loved the Model T. Uh, it was very well suited for, suited for the kind of work that they were doing on uh, battle damaged roads. You know, they had very high clearance. They were light, maneuverable, could carry up to three wounded soldiers on stretchers, more if they were seated. They referred to soldiers on stretchers by the French term couché meaning they were lying down, and wounded soldiers who could sit up were called assis. It was around December of 1917 that members of the uh, SSU 539 unit started calling themselves the Black Cats. You can see the Black Cat logo painted on some of the Model Ts pictured here. Uh, that's my grandfather in the middle leaning up against the Model T. Um, that group on the right, uh, the way that it's set up, it just reminds me of that Manet painting, Déjeuner sur l'herbe. In the lower left corner, we see again Stoddard Lane, who I mentioned before. Um, his diary really was a tremendous source of information for my book, The Black Cats of Amherst. And here's a quote. This is what he wrote after the worst of the fighting was over. I think we all surprised ourselves at the way we took the thing. It was an affair of some movement, and there was a good deal of danger in it. All sorts of narrow escapes, many glimpses of the hellishness of war, its ghastly cost, its agony, the noise of it the stench of it, the destructiveness of it, the life of towns and trees and fields and houses and men crushed out, not a thing to take lightly. Now, one of the really remarkable things about World War I uh, was that the photographic record is very, very extensive because many soldiers brought cameras with them. Very light, compact cameras were readily available, readily available and the soldiers used them extensively. Here we see four shots showing ambulances in action. In the upper left, we can see the results of some of the heavy artillery and aerial bombardment at Amiens, France. In the upper right, we see a row of about uh, a dozen vehicles. Um, the unit had about 20 ambulances. In this photo, they are near an airfield at La Noblette. And it seems like that was not uncommon. And I wonder if it was because in an airfield, they had easy access to gasoline. In the lower left, the ambulance with the Black Cat logo visible of the far panel there on the back is parked in front of a bunker entrance at Poligny. And the lower right picture was at, taken at Corsi, France. So, you know, any way you looked at this, it was ugly and horrific. Soddard Lane describes the impact of the military use of poison gas in one of his quotes that I'll read here. The Bosch were using gas plentifully which was hard on civilians and soldiers alike. Riefler took a husband and daughter, gassed, wife on the front seat calling to them. Both died on the way. That was cruel business, dirty work. The Bosch knew these civilians had no masks. Nothing had made us so thoroughly mad as seeing these civilians all banged up. Pretty rotten stuff. We were more firmly convinced than ever that Fritz must be licked. You, you hear, <laughs> in this passage, a couple of nicknames that they tended to use for the Germans, so calling him Fritz or the Bosch. 
So let me turn away from the battlefield for a few moments and investigate uh, a few memories that members of the unit brought back with them. Uh, here's an interesting photo of a man and an older woman singing together. The man is William Rogers and during his leave, he wanted to get as far away from the front as he could. He went to the south of France in hope of uh, seeing some Roman ruins. And it was there that he met two middle-aged women who had a car and were delivering gifts, chocolates, cigarettes, to wounded French soldiers. They offered to take Rogers to see the ruins and acted as though they, you know, he were their long lost nephew. They nicknamed him Kitty because he seemed so young. Now here's what the woman in the picture wrote many years after the war. Uh, you may recognize the prose. The Kitty had been with us in Nîmes. He had come to Nîmes, not because he knew about us, they naturally did not know about us then, but he came there because he wanted to see the Pont de Garde that the Romans had built over the River Gardon. We saw him then every day and he went with us and then he went away. He wrote to us and we wrote to him until the war was over and then he never wrote again. Now, any idea who that is? You can certainly write it in the, the chat. I'll give you a moment to take a, a guess at it before I tell you. Um, an interesting connection that he made that, that ultimately had a, an impact on Amherst, which we'll get to a little later. Um, so anyway, that was Gertrude Stein. Uh, the two women that adopted William Rogers were Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. Rogers visited Stein and Toklas after the war and convinced Stein to do a U.S. tour. The, the quote, what I, which I just read, is from a book that she wrote about her U.S. tour in 1934 and 1935. That tour included a stop at Amherst, where she spoke at the college on poetry and grammar. One of the items that my grandfather kept was uh, this set of drawings here. Um, that I think may have been done by a young Frenchman who the unit had adopted. His name was Roland Lebrun, and you see him in the lower uh, right-hand corner there. Um, and then also with a little menagerie that they had there uh, of, uh, of kids and, and geese, a fox, a dog, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but Roland was an orphan and he grew used to military life. Uh, when the unit left the Champagne region, they had to sadly leave him behind. Um, I look at these drawings and I think of the ones that were done by Native Americans after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Uh, there's motion, there's action and drama in them, and I, I find them really, really remarkable. Although, again, I'm, I'm just guessing at who actually drew them. A number of men in the unit were awarded Croix de Guerre medals by the French army for their acts of valor. Uh, here, seven black cats proudly display their medals. One of my favorite Croix de Guerre stories is about Black Cat DeVille Hubbard, uh, a Midwesterner. His uh, exploits are described in the cartoon at the top. Uh, in the very first panel, you see him speeding along this bumpy road as a chorus of wounded soldiers uh, shout out, ooh la la, doucement, nom de Dieu. Uh, in the second panel, the ambulance uh, drives into a ditch. Of, of course, all this was taking at place at night on unlit roads, no headlights. And then finally, in the third panel, the soldier receives his medal saying, tisn't so hard when you know how. Well, for his efforts, um, Hubbard earned the nickname Bravery, but even he was understated about it. A newspaper article shown in the lower left-hand corner there, um, after the war, he was quoted as saying, uh, we must have been making about 35 miles an hour when the car banged into a 10-foot drop where a shell had blown out a bridge. None was hurt except one of the wounded men who had a gash across his forehead. We dragged out the wounded and carried them to a house nearby. Then I walked six miles for another ambulance. That's all I did and they pinned that on me. Uh, you know, I love that line. He, he does what he thinks is nothing much and they pin a medal on him. Uh, the other cartoon you see here shows the explosion that wounded James Hinch while he was washing dishes, dishes in the kitchen. His Croix de Guerre describes his performance of duty giving proof of the greatest courage, sang froid, and energy. Now that was the only black cat who ended up being wounded during the war. A couple experienced um, uh, being in gas attacks, but they all recovered from those. Um, they considered themselves quite lucky, honestly. 
Now, here are two items that are in the archive at the University of Massachusetts. Um, the uniform belonged to Black Hat Fred Waugh. Uh, you see his croix de guerre. You see probably a better shot of that forage that we saw on uh, Lieutenant Bocock's uniform. Uh, Waugh was a private, and you can see a single private stripe on the sleeve. A little harder to see on this photograph are the unit insignia on the left arm near the shoulders. It's a white A in a red circle inside a blue field, and that refers to the US Third Army, which they were part of. Um, a white rooster on a crimson background is the insignia of the ambulance units. And honestly, that was a, a nod to the French because the rooster being a, a French national symbol. Now, as for that helmet, have a close look at that. So apparently, if you wanted to mail a war souvenir home from France, all you had to do was put an address and stamps on it. The German helmet pictured below or pictured here was sent by Lloyd Walsh to Miss Eva Risden. Now, Walsh was not a member of the Black Cats. He was from Amherst and he served in SSU 68, a different ambulance group that was made up of men from Amherst, many from the college, but some like Walsh from uh, Amherst or nearby cities and towns. Um, this item is in the Lloyd Walsh collection at the University of Massachusetts Special Collections and University Archives. And if you look closely at the lower left corner of the address label, you can see that there's a stamp and a signature showing that the helmet, like any letter that a soldier would send home, was cleared by the censor. And, and most often that was the commanding officer of the unit. Now, if you're wondering whether Eva Risden of Danby, Vermont was impressed by getting a German helmet in the mail, uh, it should be noted that she married Walsh after the war. Now, most of the black hats didn't get home until April of 1919, more than five months after the war ended. There really honestly weren't enough ships to take them home uh, quickly. So some, like my grandfather, opted to stay in France to study. It was his uncle Kenyon who was in France at that time as part of an educational initiative and managed to get his uh, nephew assigned a spot in a class for the spring semester in Grenoble, France. It was an experience that my grandfather would never forget. For those black cats who came back in April, there was one last thing they wanted to do, and that was to present their colors to Amherst College's president, Alexander Michael John, who you see in the right of the photo. This shot taken in April of 1919 shows a group of about 20 soldiers in formation with Michael John and a crowd of townspeople. You see uh, Johnson Tappel, Chapel there in the distance. And one of my favorite aspects of this photo is if you look in sort of in the upper left corner, uh, you see a boy whose silhouette is high up in the tree uh, right above the American flag there. Uh, getting a good shot of this. So this is a, a big event. Lots of townspeople came and they marched from the train station uh, to the Amherst College campus. Uh, people do often ask me why the unit chose a black cat as its symbol. Uh, and honestly, the quick answer is that, that I just don't know. Um, lots of units, including the US Army tank unit, like the fierce and threatening form of a black cat uh, and use that as their logo. For SSU 539, I think there was a bit of a contrarian aspect to their use of the black cat. They lock, they, a lot of times they would talk about having black cat good luck. So for example, if the Germans uh, attacked with poison gas and the wind was blowing it away from the ambulances, well, that was black cat good luck. Now, deep in the archive at Amherst College was this black cat unit banner that you saw in the, the photo with uh, um, the Amherst College president. It really is a marvelous artifact showing the French and American flags, an embroidered croix de guerre, a black cat, list of major operations they were involved in. And there's also a reference to the French 5th Infantry Division, which was the French army unit they were assigned to for much of the time that they were abroad. The banner was not in very good shape, so a group of alumni teamed with the college to raise money for its conservation. Uh, I visited the company that did the work on the banner. Uh, here you see one of their employees painstakingly replacing little bits of silk. Uh, and once that banner conservation project was completed, the banner and other black cat artifacts were out on temporary display at Amherst College. You see that 
display here, which includes that banner, some of the other things that they had, like their unit history, you see on the far side, a, 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 you know, another um, Forager and a um, Quadigier. Uh, and then, you know, their unit history was a big piece of uh, what they did when they came back after the war. Now, there was a smaller banner that you can see uh, in the picture in the corner there next to that American flag. And that is also in the Amherst College archives, but in, in much, much uh, poorer shape. Um, its shape is what is known as swallowtail because it narrows to two points, just like the bird's tail. Uh, in the upper left corner, you can see what's kind of left to it, left of it, the fringe and the, the cat. Uh, decided not to try to do any conservation on that, but we did create some replicas, including the one you see there on the right hand side. So their unit history. When they returned to the United States, they produced a unit history. It was published in 1920, and it went by the catchy title, Being the Book of SSU 539, United States Army Ambulance Service with the French Army, Army, and it really is just an incredible document. I was lucky in my research that another black cat descendant had a copy of the unit history and was willing to lend it to me while I was writing the book. Her name is Pat Smith, and she's the daughter of black cat um, Al Siemens. And Surprise, surprise, she lives a couple of miles from me uh, where I live in Marshfield. Lieutenant Bocock, who wrote uh, a number of essays for this unit history, uh, wrote this account, and here are a couple of quotes from that. He says, we did no medical work. Our problem was simply one of transportation. We risked our lives, and many of the men of the service gave their lives in the effort to save others. It was terribly hard, but it was never a gloomy task. And he goes on, we did not do a great deal in this war, God knows, and history will very rightly not concern herself a great deal with our doings. But the bit we did was done in the best cause yet espoused by man, and it is meet that some little account of our work be written for ourselves, not to justify our work or cause in any man's eyes, but so that we may remember, it may be, a little more plainly the wheat fields of Corsi and the desert beyond Ypres and what they mean to civilization. Now, in the uh, very lower left corner of the group shot you have here uh, is a guy named Joe Lyman. And he was from Florence, Massachusetts. He was an Amherst College sophomore when he joined the unit. Uh, he decided not to return to Amherst College after this, his service, his war service, and instead he turned his focus to journalism. He was the managing editor of the Hampshire Gazette when he died of a cerebral hemorrhage in 1937. Now he wrote several poems for the unit history, including this one, which is called The Letter to Dad, which is really is a, a, a favorite of mine. A couple of things about this. He uses that nickname, the Bosch, for the German Germans. He makes a ref reference to Mitch, who's Donald Mitchell, an Amherst College sophomore who was a sergeant in the section. And then at the very end, he makes a pun, which I, I find amusing. So let me re recite this. My life as a cook for the section is dull, I told Mitch with a grunt. I see but the verbal reflection of all that goes on at the front. Perhaps to improve the gang's diet, he sent me next day to a post where action thus far had been quiet with shells in the background at most. But Burns made a true observation on plans both of mice and of men. And I heard some real detonation before I saw Mitchell again. The Bosch must have known my ambition and wished me to sample their ire. That night, they raised holy perdition and tried to baptize me with fire. Their shells gave me intimate greeting. My hair stiffened under my hat. July 4th is a calm Quaker meeting beside a bombardment like that. I'm writing intact and quite well, sire, but I've seen sufficient, I guess. The fellow who first christened shell fire prefixed a superfluous S. Now, another member of the unit was a guy named Hal Shepard. He was from Pelham. 
and he wasn't an Amherst College or Mass Aggie student, but somehow we find out about the unit and joined up with the first of the recruits. You see him here uh, in the middle. He was in that picture of four soldiers with my grandfather showing off their uniforms. Um, on the left hand side, he's wearing a gas mask. I'm still pretty sure that's him. It ended up in a photo album. Uh, he either took the photo or he's the guy in the ambulance. And there he is on the right hand side up against one of their vehicles as well. Now, in the 1920s, Shepard's father was named postmaster of Amherst, and he used that uh, position to create a black cat cancel for letters that was used at the Amherst Post Office for a short period, a couple of weeks in November of 1928. And I believe that Shepard's father got that idea when he saw a Yale bulldog being used to cancel some mail that came out of New Haven. William Burnett was another Amherst College sophomore who joined the unit. If you're familiar with the William A. Burnett house on Sunset Avenue, well, William A. was his father. And his grandfather, George B. Burnett, was well known in town for having a successful straw hat factory. I'd like to say a little bit more about Stoddard Lane. Uh, he was a 1909 graduate of Amherst College who'd already completed his divinity school degree and was serving a congregation in New Jersey when he left that post to join the Black Cats. Uh, after completing my book, uh, The Black Cats of Amherst, in which I leaned heavily on his diaries, I was compelled to publish an annotated transcription of those diaries. Now that book I completed that in January under the title, We Unite to Serve the Wartime Diaries of Reverend Stoddard Lane. And that title comes from a motto that he brought to a congregation he served in Des Moines, Iowa. And the full motto goes, we agree to differ, we resolve to love, we unite to serve. Oops. So, I'll uh, end my presentation on those memorable words and remind folks that I'm happy to take questions. If you're interested in learning more about my work, the best place to start is my website, greenharbor.com. Uh, my books can be ordered on demand from lulu.com at the address you see on the screen. Uh, this includes a book I wrote about a group of World War II correspondents who trained to fly uh, in high altitude uh, bombing missions with the 8th Air Force out of England. That group included, that group, the Writing 69th, included Walter Cronkite and Andy Rooney. One member of that unit, Robert Post of the New York Times, you see pictured there on the left, was killed on their first mission when the B-24 he was on was shot down over Germany. Uh, an interesting read, but again, one with no Amherst connections that I am aware of. And those of you who are on Twitter can follow the Black Cats of Amherst account at SSU 539. And feel free to email me with any questions at jim at greenharbor.com. So, that wraps it up for me, and I would be delighted to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much. I had a question, which was, um, did members of the Black Cats stay in touch with each other a lot after the war? Oh, they Were did. Reunions, letters, that sort of thing. They did. Um, they had a what they call the round robin uh, newsletter essentially where they would send in information to one central uh, editor and he would then create a mimeograph newsletter and send it around to everybody. They met at various times. They went to each other's weddings. I mean, not necessarily all in group, but ones and onesies and twosies. Um, one of the amazing things I've seen a couple of are engraved candlesticks that have SSU 539 and the unit history on them, uh, not the unit history, and the unit name on it. So SSU 539 and Black Cats engraved into a pair of candlesticks that you would give somebody at their wedding. So they really did keep in touch. The unit history was kind of a part of it. And the fact that they had um, that connection really kind of helped promote this idea of the Black Cats of Amherst. Because there was another ambulance unit that formed around the same time, the one I mentioned. Um, and again, it only had a handful of Amherst people in it. Some of them were going over there for a much shorter stint. Uh, rather than joining the army, they were doing it through AFS. And so that unit, although again, uh, created in the same area, didn't necessarily have the same cohesion that the Amherst unit did. And I found out some great things in those round robin newsletters because they told stories. For example, one of them, which I thought was great was, um, 
the question was sort of sent around to the group, what things did you do that you never told the sergeant about? And one of the guys admitted creating a code so that he could communicate to his girlfriend where he was in Europe because he knew his letters would be censored. And so um, depending on whether he used her first initial in, you know, in the address, uh, you know, he would send her a message that was maybe made out of the first word of every single paragraph. So getting really clever about, uh, you know, trying to get some information through the censors. And one guy got caught doing that, interestingly enough. Uh, didn't get kicked out of the unit, but that was, uh, you know, that there was a, a penalty associated with it. I think he dropped the rank. I, I wonder what the dynamic was like between um, students and teachers, um, maybe not when they were serving in the unit, but when they came back to the college. So I'm sorry, say that again. <clears throat> you had some students and some faculty who were in the unit, and then when they came back to college and resumed their former lives, did they go back to being, you know, formally students and teachers, or were they? Um, so interesting. I, again, a bunch of them uh, ended up becoming French teachers afterwards. Um, and I think because of having had that experience and having a chance to practice a bunch of their friend, uh, their French, um, some didn't return to school like Joe Lyman, you know, decided that, you know, that wasn't for him. Others, if they completed enough time, were able to um, uh, get essentially what they call the war degree, not necessarily doing a full BA, but getting credit for the time you've done and some for your war service. Um, that actually was the case with my grandfather, although he did come back, you know, so he left after his freshman year, he came back for what was essentially a senior year. Um, and, you know, that was that was it for him. He didn't spend four years on campus. Um, and by that time, too, you can imagine if you are let's say a 22 or a 23 year old coming back and then are in class with 18 and 19 year olds and you've been through the war, it's a very different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. I do see a question, a couple of points here. Um, one question was about uh, the, the poem that Joe Lyman wrote, uh, you know, a letter to dad and whether that was written during the war um, or after the fact. Um, I believe it was written during the war, although, um, and, and I say this mainly because there were several poems that he wrote. Um, and one of those poems I saw in a letter that someone wrote home, you know, someone had heard Lyman's poem, copied it down in a letter and sent it home. And that was one of the poems that appeared in the unit history in 1920. So um, it was either, you know, while they were there, while they were there or very shortly afterward. The other thing that they did, well, they did a couple of other things that are interesting, I think. They did a number of theatrical presentations. William Rogers, the guy who met uh, Gertrude Stein, was behind a number of those. And they also had what they called like educational teas because at, you know, for large points of being in the army or just sitting around and not necessarily having a lot to do. And they felt like their mental faculties were just declining. So they, um, uh, would lecture on topics that they knew about to the group, you know, whether it was Shakespeare or, I don't know, farming or some book that they had read. So they really did pick up on that stuff. And, and I was surprised that the unit history came out so quickly after the war. Um, they, they put together a committee and they, they got it together with some amazing photos that were really just tipped in to the uh, overall document. And there are a couple of copies of that in the Amherst College um, uh, archive. And I, as I said, I was lucky to be able to borrow one from a neighbor. Um, I, I see, I don't know if this is so much a question as a comment, but Hemingway there, I'm sure many of you watched the, uh, the recent, um, you know, PBS documentary and Hemingway was an uh, ambulance driver, uh, really for a very short period of time until he was badly wounded. Um, he was in Italy, uh, as opposed to these guys. So, you know, there were ambulance drivers on the Italian front, there were ambulance drivers uh, uh, on the French side. And, um, you know, this group, which in included some people who ended up being fairly well known, you know, uh, an, econo uh, an economist, um, actually Stoddard Lane ended up getting an honorary degree of divinity from Amherst College and was very active among congregational ministers after the war. Um, it's, it's an interesting group. 
I'm looking at a question here. So what advice would you give to other writers about developing a project like this? Um, well, I love great source material and I had a lot of it here. And if you look at the book, The, the Black Cats of Amherst, um, I would just say other people wrote a lot of it um, rather than me. And I say that in the sense that I quoted from diaries, I quoted from letters, I got contemporary newspaper articles, I tried to show as many photographs and maps as you could. So, uh, I mean, one piece of advice that I have is, uh, you know, find great source material and follow it where it leads. Um, what is also interesting today is that, um, you know, you can track down relatives. Um, one of the funny things about this group, I mean, you asked about, uh, did they get together? Well, after they married and had started having kids, they considered their kids to be black kittens. You know, they were black cats or their kids were black kittens. And there are a couple of black kittens still around today, uh, including the woman Stoddard Lane's uh, daughter who wrote the, um, the foreword for uh, the book that I did on his diaries, um, Pat Smith, who lives in Marshfield, and sort of I'm a grand black kitten in that that sense. And so that connection helped, but really my grandfather's materials were uh, um, good, but not as good as what I could find through Stoddard Lane's diary and also uh, through the materials in the Amherst College archive. I mean, here's one interesting point about that archive, which I, which I love, is that anybody who ever um, got into Amherst College and was there for, I don't know, a semester or graduated from there, there's a folder in the basement about, uh, you know, that particular student. And you can look at those folders. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what, you know, what happened to somebody, um, and particularly during the war, the college served as this almost intermediary because parents would be worried their kids are off in, you know, battlefield someplace, and they may not be hearing directly from the child, but they may know that the school is hearing from them or getting news, or in the case of where it was, you know, associated as an Amherst College unit, parents would try to see if anybody else had written back to the school. And really this, to me, World War I particularly strengthened alumni connections with the school, um, in part because there were those communications, there was uh, alumni, uh, you know, uh, magazines and that, that kind of stuff. Um, but what it also convinced people of was that the alumni had a very significant level of power uh, and they could wield that in ways, you know, if they didn't like the way the curriculum was going or whatever, they had more power really than they had in the past. And I think uh, that that developed during World War I and also during World War II. So now I don't see any other questions, but if anybody has one, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Anyone? Well, thank you for a fascinating presentation. I recently saw uh, the film, uh, They Shall Not Grow Old, oh, wow. which is about World War I using archival footage. Um, and it gives a lot of background to your talk too. But um, well, one, I, one, actually, one, one thing I would mention uh, in your area, Ed Klikowski has also done a documentary on um, on World War uh, World War One ambulance use and the Model T, and actually has written a fair amount. He's a good local resource. Him and Libby Klikowski um, around some of the, some of these ish, these uh, you know issues around World War Two World War One history. And uh, he's even done a, a book of fiction based on some of that. So interesting stuff. And he was a UMass professor who got into this after, uh, after he retired. Mm -hmm. I'll be sure to look him up. Yeah. Other questions? I don't see any, but um, I think you posted your email. So um, people who have questions later on can always get in touch with you or get in touch with you through the Amherst History Society. And once again, we thank you for a fascinating lecture. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much.